Hey, my name is Blake Davis and I'm the pastor here. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Firm Foundation Church podcast. Our desire every single week is that you are challenged and encouraged in your faith. Enjoy the message. All right, so two important announcements before I start. Number one, there's no shame allowed here. So if you have a failed marriage in the past, leave that in the past, okay? The, the message series is called From This Day Forward, and that's what our stance is. What are we going to do from this day forward? We all have things in our background, whether it's a fault of our own or not, that we're not, you know, we wish we had done differently or wish hadn't happened. But there's two verses I want to share with you real quick, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had, has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And verse two, Romans eight, one through two. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin of death and sin and death. No shame here. All right, number two, if you're in an abusive, an abusive relationship, marriage or relationship, get help, okay? Emotionally, physically, please do not hear as we speak about never giving up and continuing that we're telling you to stay in an abusive situation, okay? So get help, come to us, we'll help you get help. All right, we're, not, we're, not, um, we're not telling you to stay and to keep being a doormat to someone that's abusive, all right? All right, number, that's number two. All right, one and two, let's go. All right, five things that we've talked about so far. Number one, commitment. Do you guys remember it? The very first one. Seek God. Number two? Fight fair. fair. We did two weeks on that. Number three? Have fun. Number four? Stay pure. pure. And today is never give up. All right. So I read a story this week that somebody had asked Ruth Graham. She was married to Billy Graham. They had said, hey, have you ever considered divorcing Billy Graham? And she said, divorce, no. Murder, yes. (laughs) And I love that. And I know like there's some times where we feel like we must have made a commitment to drive each other insane for the rest of our life because that's what it feels like, right? And we think, but we think we're going to stick with this even if it kills us. And I know that there's seasons like that, but I really don't think that's how God meant us to live out our marriages, right? And I heard, I listened to about eight marriage, series, marriage sermons this week. I felt so much wife conviction this week. I don't recommend eight, eight marriage sermons in one week, but I don't remember if it was Jimmy Evans or John Bevere, but he said, whichever one, he said, my wife and I have decided that our marriage is going to be as good as we both decide it's going to be. And I thought that was really good. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Like, how do we have a, a never give up, not just on a good, on a marriage, but on a good marriage, okay? So let's, let's get started. Number one, the first thing, if you want to have, you want to fight for a good marriage, the first thing that you need to do is never give up on your own transformation, okay, on your own, looking at yourself, I want to be transformed. I really think that if you both are constantly working on your own transformation, your marriage is going to be okay. Your marriage is going to succeed. All right, so I'm 42. I know that women don't like to tell their age, but I don't really get that. I mean, you can't help when you were born, right? You're, I'm, I'm 42. That's just the way it is. And I feel like it's this awkward stage where you're not young anymore, but you're not really old and wise yet either. You're just, it's just really weird. Early 40s, it's just really weird. And also, it's even weirder for me because I have adult kids, one getting married in less than four weeks now, and then I have a three-year-old, you know? So I feel, and I'm really too young to have these older kids. We had them really young. And I was really too old to have Nora, but I had her anyway. And so I I'm, I'm really feel like I don't fit in anywhere a lot of the times. But I saw this great meme this week. I can put it up. I had, didn't decide. It said, I'm at the age where I could date you or your daddy. <laughs> I loved that. I loved it so much because I was like, I could, I could look at it. Anybody else 40? Like, does that make you feel better? Yeah. Because I mean, we, you can take it off now. Um, you know, we could, we could consider ourselves not in any, any, any category or we can consider ourselves in both categories. And I decide that it's, it's a great age because I can fit into either side. So anyway, this week I was... You put it up again. Next week, this last week, okay, we went to Bible college at Christ for the Nations in Dallas, and we graduated 20 years ago. And we have a few friends that we've kept up with all that through this last 20 years. But one of them, she posted, she tagged somebody and said, we got to see this guy that we went to Bible college with. And, you know, she popped up this big picture on, on my feed. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, I remember him. <laughs> okay, we can delete the, delete the cowboys. Okay, so um, anyway, I was like, I remember him. And I was like, I would have never recognized him. He had gray hair. He had wrinkles around his eyes. And like, this guy was really popular, well, really well known at our Bible college. And I was just like, are we really that old? Like, he just looked so old. He wasn't bad looking or anything. He just looked like it had been 20 years. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, if somebody saw me that hadn't seen me for 20 years, they would be just as shocked. Like 20 years is a long time. I've gone through lots of changes. I look older. And then I just had this thought hit me, like, have I changed that much on the inside? Do I look 20 years more like Jesus? Do I love Jesus 20 more years worth of walking with him? And I, I think there was a little bit of me that could say, yeah, I have changed but I don't know that I've changed 20 years worth. I wish I had surrendered more. I wish I was closer. I want in the next 20 years to be more changed like Jesus on the inside than I am on the outside. That's my goal. Okay, Romans 12:2. Romans Listen to this verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's a process by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed. So while you're getting older and weaker on the outside, on the inside, we should be getting renewed. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, or they're passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So as I get older, my inner self should be getting stronger. And I think maturity in the Lord is directly related to two things, how we handle affliction and how we handle conviction, okay? And so I think back to um, after Bible college, Blake got a job at Gateway Church in South Lake. It was so interesting because I had a call to mission work to the poor. Like that was my heart. It had been since I was 11 years old. And out of Bible college, Blake got a job in a church in the richest city in Texas. And I was like, what on earth are we doing here? And I was a little, I was a little grumpy about it. I was a little like this, these aren't my people. Um, They get pedicures and boob jobs. Like this is not, this is not my people. Like I don't, I don't do this. And so anyway, I um, prayed about it. And like probably six months into the time there, I felt like God said, you're here to learn how to honor your husband. And I was like, okay, well, we're, we're probably going to be here a while because I had, I had a little bit to go. We got married at 18 and 19. Y'all, have y'all ever met an 18-year-old boy? <laughs> I married one, guys. I married an 18-year-old boy. And I was 19, but I was one of those kids that at 10, I acted more like I was 40 than I was 10. I was very, I told my mom when I was 10, I'm going to have four kids. And she said, no, you're not. You are too you know, you're, you're too, um, she said it much nicer. She's probably listening. So I got to be honest about it. She was probably, she probably didn't just say, no, you're not. But she said, you've got to have everything just so. Everybody's got to cater to how you want things. You, four kids will drive you insane. I don't think that's going to happen. And so anyway, he married, you know, 18 year old boy marries 19, really 40 year old me. And I had, I had his clothes scheduled out. Like he had to ask me what he was going to wear in the mornings. I had, um, our schedule, like from the time he walked in the door from work, what we were going to do, when we were going to do it. Um, What else? What else did I do that was crazy? Oh, okay. Also, my dad, when I was a teenager, when I was like 12 or 13, he said, I'm not letting you get married until you have $10,000 in the bank. So Blake and I were like 14 and 15 when we started being boyfriend and girlfriend. And I was like, let's both get $10,000 in the bank. So when we got married at 18 and 19, we had $20,000 in the bank. Okay. And of course I had every penny, like this is when we're going to spend every penny. You know, we're not penny so that we, you know, I was just ridiculous. I remember one day he came home and we, um, it was like the end of the month and I was, we were not going to grocery shop till the next month, but we were almost completely out of food. And I made him only eat half a sandwich. <laughs> and he's, he was like eating his half a sandwich and he said, I can't believe I've got $20,000 in the bank and I can only eat half a sandwich for dinner tonight. So y'all, I, I had some problems. And God said, you're not, you're, we're not leaving here. You're not leaving this place until you learn how to honor your husband. And I was like, okay, God, what does that look like? And one of the things he told me was, any chance, any time you don't have to make this decision, don't. 
And so I, I started switching things around. He would come home and be like, what are we going to do tonight? And I would say, I don't know. What do you want to do? You know? And he would say, what are we having for dinner tomorrow? Or I don't know. And he'd be like, where's the schedule? He'd be like, what am I wearing today? I don't know. Whatever you want to wear. And um, it, was, it was probably a little bit of a slower thing, but it was, it was different. And you guys, now we've switched. Like he makes me put my car keys on the one hook and heaven forbid I put my purse on the same hook. He's like, this hook is for keys and keys only. Also, we don't live in excess except for pillows. We both have four, four pillows each. We have lots of pillows. We have to have a king size bed to fit all our pillows. And he has his four pillows. Like, and they have different pillowcases because he doesn't want, he wants to use those four pillows. And I always go to bed earlier than he does. I don't care what pillows I use. I don't care what the covers. I don't make my bed, guys. I don't even make my bed anymore. I am so free. Um, so, <laughs> so I get in, I get in bed at, at night. And I also our kids like are play in our bed during the day. Like it's a it's a tornado when I get in. I don't care. I'm tired. I lay on the bed. I cover the covers. And he comes in every night and he's like. <sighs> And he like pulls his pillows out from under my head and gives me my pillows and fixes the covers. And I'm just like, this is craziness. This is craziness. But this is transformation. It's going to look different from you guys. This is transformation. And another thing that I realized this summer, we went on vacation and he went on vacation too. Like he didn't want to make any decisions. And so I would say, what do you want to, where are we going to stop for lunch? And he'd say, I don't know. And I would panic. Like, who's going to decide? So Anyway, that ended up being a lot longer than I meant for it to be. But I went through a transformation, and now, and it helped us. Like, Blake not only started making decisions at home, but he started being more confident at work. He started being more confident in himself. He started, um, the job that he had at Gateway, he ran a what kind of budget? Like, give me the, give me a number. Six-figure budget for his work. Like, he couldn't have done that if he had been, demasculated constantly by me, right? And when we went to, when he became a pastor, if I had been still like calling the shots, he couldn't have pastored in confidence. And then I, if going to Guatemala, I would have died there if I had been still type A because things are, are, are just different than here. But he got flexible, flexible to me, you know? He molded me so that I could handle what was next. And so as we learn how to be, um, as we learn how to, what's the word I use, sorry? as we learn how to transform the way God wants us to, he's got the future in mind, right? All right, hold on, let me get back to my, my points here. All right, so one thing, one thing I recognize too is that, and this still happens, I mean, we're not, we're not perfect. If I go to God with a complaint about him, he almost always turns it back on me. Does anybody else relate with that? And that's because God's not a gossip. Like, we wish he was. We wish we could go to him and complain about one of his kids and he would say, right, there's such a, you know, whatever. God doesn't do that. And so if you've had a conversation with God and it hasn't spurred you on towards love, I don't think you talk to God, okay? And so um, recognize that if you're gonna go to God with a complaint, he's gonna talk to you about how you can love better. I'll just go ahead and warn you. And so I'm gonna give you, um, I'm gonna give you a story real quick. Something that's happened recently. I'm gonna be vulnerable. Um, a few weeks ago, I felt like I heard the Lord say something to me. And it was something that would make, mean a change for us, like a, something, an action needed to be taken. And I knew, I knew that that was something that God wanted us to do. Like, I just felt it. I was praying the word every day. I was reading, po- reading blogs and podcasts, or like, and everything pointed to this. And I kept telling Blake, I need you to pray. I need you to ask the Lord about this. This is what I'm feeling. Every day he'd come home from work, and he'd, I'd be like, what is God telling you? And I just he would say something like, God told me he loved me today. God told me what, you know, I needed to put this verse in my message. And I was just getting more and more irritated with him until I could barely like tolerate him because he wasn't listening to God. Like how terrible that I'm having to be the spiritual leader of this home and he's not like praying and listening to God, you know? And so anyway, I was pressing into the Lord one day. No, I wasn't. I was on Instagram. And this... (laughs) This quote came up, and um, the Lord just, like, slammed, slammed it and made it, a, made it my quiet time. And it's, yep, that was a good quote. If your conversation with God doesn't spur you on to love, you probably weren't talking to him. Did I miss any other ones? What's next? All right, here's the quote from Instagram. It says, oh, and he, it was to me, it was highlighted. If a woman is truly more spiritually advanced 
The last thing she's going to do is lord it over her husband. True spiritual advancement would mean ugh, greater humility, teachability, and submission. Being puffed up with knowledge creates the opposite effect. And some wives think they are more spiritual than their husbands when they are actually just puffed up. Oh, yeah, he broke me down. He broke down my flesh. I felt so justified. But guess what? Even spiritual feelings can lie to you. They're still coming through the filter of your own selfishness. And so, man, I, I thought of this this week. I was like, God can only make your marriage as great as the most stubborn person is willing to conform, to transform. Didn't say it. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I was sure that Blake was the most stubborn person. And really, God brought it back around. He's like, no, Christina, you're the most stubborn person. So be careful when you're thinking about how stubborn your spouse is. It could be, it could be actually you. But there are times where we're the ones that feel like we're transforming so much and our spouse isn't willing to do that. And so I have this verse for you, Galatians 6, 9. It's a promise we can hold on to. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. All right? So number one, be committed to your own transformation. Number two, be committed to your spouse's becoming. Okay? It's a little different, and this is how. It's kind of nuanced. With us, we're focused on the details. We have to be focused on our own details of our own transformation. With our spouse, we need to be focused on the big picture of who they're becoming. And when we were at Gateway Church, the pastor, Robert Morris, he said he went through like a wild stage in his early 20s. Even when he was preaching, he was also, you know, having affairs and partying and all that. And he said, my Debbie, his wife, he said, she always treated me like I was the man I am today way before I, I was the man I am today. Like back when I wasn't who I was supposed to be being, she treated me with honor. And so I want to just, I just want us to get, ask God to give us a vision of who he's making our spouse. And then I want us to start treating them that way, as if they were that way. I remember when we were, God called us to adopt. We started the adoption process. This is when we were in South Texas. And it just, everything, we were trying to adopt from Ethiopia and everything just came to a halt over there. And I remember crying on the front row, like, God, you told us that we were supposed to start this process. And um, he said, worship me, I think. We were singing, You Are Stronger. Do you remember that song? You Are Stronger. You are strong. I can't sing, so I won't do it. But we were singing that song, and he said, worship me. And I said, okay, I'm going to worship you like I believe you're going to do it. And he said, no, worship me like I've already done it. And that church ended up supporting us in Guatemala, and about four years later, I was standing on the front row with Grayson, worshiping God because he had done it. And so I think that's the same thing with our spouse. We know where God wants to take them, and we're going to treat them like they're already there. Oh, it's hard, but we can do it. All right, a verse, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. So if I'm supposed to consider you all better than myself and look out for your interest, how much more am I supposed to do that for Blake, right? All right, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. I want to tell you guys another story. Um, several years ago, I had a lady reach out to me. We had mutual friends. I'd met her several times, and she asked to meet with me. She was in ministry. She was older than me, been in ministry more than me, longer than me, and she asked to meet with me. So we met at a coffee shop in between, and real quick into the meeting, I, she said she wanted to meet with me regularly, and I recognized she wanted to be my mentor. Just by how she was, she wanted to be my mentor, and I was open to it, but she immediately started giving me advice, and I was kind of like, okay, what's I didn't say this. I just thought it. Like, what's your basis for giving me this advice? Like, why do you think that I need this advice? I was already pretty quickly a little irritated. <laughs> and then after a little bit of that, she said, I think you are, and she named three things. And if I'm honest, she was right on. I am all three of those things. But she did something else. She put the word to, T-O-O, in front of each word. I think you're to this to this and to this. How many of you have been told you're to something? You know, they've taken something that is about who you are, but then they've added to in it. You're too quiet. You're too loud. You're too opinionated. You're too weak. You're too strong. You're too smart. You're too dumb. (laughs) You know, and it it hurts, right? Because like there's some truth to that. And also 
We all know that about ourselves, right? We all know the things about ourselves and we all know that they can be too much sometimes. And so while I went in there with hope, I walked out with like a backpack of shame. And I was like, what do I do with this, you know? And so after about two weeks of trying to process it on my own and listen to my husband, but like, you know, he's kind of like my mom. Like he has to say the nice things about me, you know? So I ended up calling another mentor and I said, I just met with this lady, and she said, I'm to this, to this, to this. And she said, you are that, that, and that. She didn't put the two in it. And she said, and God is using all those things in your life for good. And she said, do they have negative tendencies that you have to fight? Yes. But instead of focusing on that, focus on how you can use them to minister to people and how to become stronger and how to love the people around you. Who do you think I want to mentor me? (laughs) Like, how many times more did I sit in front of that lady and let her speak to me? Zero. Zero. And so I was just thinking this week, though, but how many times do we do that to our spouses? Like, we, we know all their two. You know, we know all their things. And we passively, if not, you know, directly remind them constantly, you're, you're to this, you're to this, you're this, or I wish this. And, and why, how many times do we make them feel like they could get up from the table and never come back, Right. And so I, I was also reminded of whenever we were looking for houses, we, we moved back from Guatemala, we lived in an apartment for a year, and then we needed a house. We got in a house right before shutdown. I'm so glad if I'd been stuck in an apartment with four, four and a half kids for a year, I probably, it would have been awful. But anyway, God got us a house. But when we were looking, we would go to a house and we would wipe our feet off real good at the front door. And as long as our realtor didn't tell us, you know, to take our, or we, he didn't take his shoes off or she didn't take her shoes off, we would just walk through the house, make sure our feet were clean, you know. But then we ended up, you know, buying one of the houses in that neighborhood where you pick which, which model you want. And then we got to watch the house being built from ground up. And when it got to where there was floors in and carpets in, when we got to the house, we took our shoes off before we even went in the house. We made our kids take our shoes off. We glared at the people working on it if they weren't, if they had their shoes on. Like, this was our house. This was our build. We were going to live here, Dad Gummit. We were careful with the floors. And I think about that verse that says we should build each other up. And here, like, I need to build Blake up. And so the last thing I want to do, and it's going to affect me, right? Like, how he is, who he turns into is going to affect me. And so the last thing I want to do is stomp through who he is with dirty shoes, and so we need to make a determination that we're going to leave our nasty shoes and our nasty words outside, and we're going to build with encouragement. So um, we, I think Blake said he said this at another, another week, but they say that you need to say three positive things at least to balance out a negative thing. And so let's practice that. Like if we feel like we want to complain to our spouse, let's try to think of three positive things to say first. All right, men, talking to you real quick. Right? Nope. Talking to women first. Okay. Women. Um, I heard somebody say this week, men have two, the two greatest fears that men have are to be controlled and to be found inadequate or to be seen inadequate. So I texted Blake and I said, do you feel like that's true? And he said, yes, 100%. And so that's another thing that, you know, going back to the whole encouragement, like the, there's, so many times we as wives feed into those two fears for them of trying to control or trying to show them where they're not measuring up. And so Priscilla Shire, did I say her? Shire, Shire, she said that, I was listening to her talk, and she said that God gave her a challenge one time, and she said, for 24 hours, I don't want you to criticize, question, or revamp, which means like give a better idea, you know, to, for your husband. Like I would, none of it. No criticizing, revamping, or questioning for 24 hours. And she said it was the hardest thing she's ever done. And I, but I thought that was so good because you don't recognize how much you're constantly critiquing. All right, that was, the, that was for the women. Maybe try, try to do those three positives over the one negative. All right, men, wives need to feel two, need two things, okay? I think Jimmy Evans said this. They need to feel secure and they need to know you are in tune with them, okay? So they need to be, they need to be heard. They need to know you, you care, and they need to know you will take action if needed. So I'm telling Blake this this week because I'm like going over my sermon. And I said, we need to be heard and we need to be under, what did I say? I'm sorry. I keep coming back to this. We need to know you care and we need to know that you will fix it if it's needed to be fixed. Don't fix it if it doesn't, but if it does, we need you to fix it. And he's like, how do we know? And I said, 
Well, I don't really know. I can't tell you. And I just, I told him, I was like, I'm sorry. I know. We know we're complicated, right? We, we don't envy you. But we appreciate if you continue to make the effort of like, I hear you, I care, and let me know if I can do something. So I went um, on a women's retreat one time. It was like a Friday night and a Saturday. I've told some of you this. And um, so it's a lot. It was a lot of woman time. Like, and we were in a big stadium. All you could see was women. We were there for hours on Friday. We spent the night, you know, with our church ladies. We got up the next morning, went straight there, and we were there all day long with women. (laughs) I felt my anxiety starting to rise, like, midway Saturday, and I wasn't really sure why. But then, before they started the evening session, they were like, somebody's here to talk about Compassion International, and up comes a man on the stage. I felt my anxiety level drop by several points, just because there, I was like, that's the problem. Like, I haven't seen a man in <laughs> 24 hours. Like, and I thought to myself, if there's a fire here or an active shooter, I hope I'm as close to that man as I can be, because this place will be chaos, because there's just something stabilizing about a man, okay? And why, why am I telling you men that? I, I guess I'm just, because I'm not going to tell you what to do better. You know, Blake can do that. But I just want to tell you, like, you guys are important to us. Like, you, whether you're our husband or not, there's something about you being in the room that brings a feeling of it's going to be okay. And there's, she said, I think it's Priscilla Shire, she said, there's nothing better than a man who feels like a man. And that's a man that's not controlling, not out of control, but just controlled. Like, you know that no matter where you are in the female thing of emotions, you've got somebody that's steady. And so I just want you to know that we appreciate that. That's important to us. We don't envy that you have to deal with our ups and downs, but we need you, okay? And we need each other. When I think about how many times, um, if I'm about to send out a text message or an email or make a decision, as much as possible, I ask Blake what he thinks because he's, he's like this. And a lot of times Blake asks me in return, because I feel the nuances. Like he, he might say, I need to send this text message or I need to send this email. Would you read it? And I'll be like, ah, oh, that comes off a little harsh or they might read into it like that. And so I love the beauty of that, right? We need each other. One's not better than the other. <laughs> okay, so anyway, let's ask ourselves these two questions. I've got two questions. I don't remember, did I, we write these down or not? And thinking about committing to our um, partners becoming. Ask ourselves, how can I use my personality or my masculinity, femininity to build into my spouse. And number two, of our spouse, what if we ask them, what is it that you need to feel better loved by me? It's a hard one. All right, guys, so the first one was our own transformation. Second, our spouse's betterment, our spouse is becoming. And number three, the last one, never give up on the covenant, the fact that it's a covenant. Um, Genesis 2, 24, okay? This is right after God made Eve out of Adam's rib. And he told he brought him to to Eve. I mean, brought him to Adam, and Adam was like, "This is, you know, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh," and makes that little declaration. And then Genesis says, "Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh." And then in Matthew, Jesus is on the earth, walking the earth, teaching, preaching, and he brings this up again. Okay, so this is Jesus in Matthew nineteen. He answered that Jesus. Have you not read, in Genesis, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He adds this, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore, who? God has joined together. Let not man separate. All right, so let's, let's compare, contrast a commit um, a contract with a covenant, just to kind of understand what a covenant is. A contract is something that you might make if you have a rental property. Who has a rental property in here? Anybody have rental properties? Okay, so you would sign a contract with that person because you don't trust them, right? You don't know them, you don't trust them, and they want it too because they don't trust you. Contracts are made with the foundation of distrust, but covenants are made from the foundation of commitment. You're saying everything you are, everything you have, everything you always will be, I'm making part of myself. And you're saying everything I am, everything I have, everything I ever will have or will be is yours, okay? And when you do that, God gets involved, right? 
it says that God joins you together. And so when you make that covenant, it's not just between you and that your spouse, it's you, your spouse, and God. And it's like he takes two pieces of paper and he glues them together. And he says, before you were married, you were complete. You don't have to have a spouse. But once you're married, you're not complete without the other one. And that's why divorce is painful regardless, because it was never meant to be, right? And so we need to continue to remind ourselves that we're in a covenant with our spouse and God. And it's a beautiful and a powerful and a supernatural thing. I'm not exactly sure what God does, but it's a supernatural thing. And we need to continue to remember to honor it. Hebrews 13, four says that marriage should be honored by all. And I'm using my own terminology. Anybody who messes that up will be judged. You have no choice but to honor and commit to the covenant. The other day when I was working on the sermon, Blake decided to homeschool the kids for me that morning, which was amazing. And I was in the living room studying and typing, and I heard Grayson say, I can't do it. And, Lo- and Blake said, then try harder. <laughs> and I feel like that's how we are with marriage sometimes. Like, I can't do it. And God says, well, then try harder. And so I just want to say that to encourage you, not to exhort you. Like, if you're ticked off right now, go home and try harder. Okay? All right, let me see. I'm going to be almost done, so I think I'm going to skip a little bit. All right, I'll tell you one more story. This lady said she felt like she was a stay-at-home mom. Her husband got home every night. She was exhausted. She was cranky, exhausted, fed up, and she was just irritable. And she recognized that she'd been that way for days and weeks, and that her husband was starting to be not so kind himself, okay? And so she sat down the table with him one night when everybody was in bed, and she said, what kind of home do you want to come home to? And he said, I want it to be just warm, like a hug. I want you to be happy to see me, and I want us to play with the kids, and I just want it to be a peaceful place. And she said, okay. And then she was quiet, and he recognized, okay, I think it's my turn to talk. And he said, you know, he had a moment of Holy Spirit wisdom. He said, what do I have to do so that you can authentically provide that? Have the capacity to authentically provide that. And so she told him, and they created a strategy and a plan. And that feels silly if you've ever done that. We've done that before, like sat down and been like, okay, what, what are you feeling? What am I feeling? What needs to happen? It feels like a business meeting. But guys, if we're going to have strategic business meetings about work or at church or like how much more does our marriage need that? Because that, that's going to last forever, right? And so I just want to encourage you, like ask each other, one of you start, what is it that you want our marriage to look like? What is it you want me to be like when I'm at home? And share and then switch and say, well, what do I need to do to make that happen? I just thought that was a really neat, a neat idea. Okay, so I'm going to give you your homework and I'm going to follow up with one last story, okay? Homework, number one, find something encouraging to say or write to your spouse every day this week. Write it all out tonight if you need to. Separate it out each day and make sure it's something personal. Like, don't just say you know, you cook good. (laughs) Like, make it like you are something, something about who they are. We just heard a story this week about a man and wife who were married for like 60 years, right? He wrote his wife a note and left on the table a poem. Yeah, that's right. A poem every single day of their marriage. Um, We're like, okay, if he can do that, like we can write a note every day for seven days or say. Okay, so you may, every day. Number two, let's do Priscilla Shire's challenge. And I feel like men can do it to women as well. Blake is the most uncritical husband in the world, so, like, this is going to be easy for him. Maybe you should be, like, for 24 hours, Christina can put her keys wherever she wants, sleep on whatever pillow she wants. (laughs) She can park a little bit seven inches closer than I want her to park. Um, I'll let her do whatever she wants. I I don't even have a seat at the table. Like, don't tell me that I have to sit in the same seat at the kitchen table. Like, he's got his seat, I'll leave it alone. But the other six, just whichever one calls to me every time. I don't, don't, don't put me in a box. All right, so go 24 hours without criticizing, questioning, or revamping. And if you mess up, 24 hours starts over, all right? All right, last thing. Um, whenever I was, oh, we were worshiping youth pastors in South Texas for about four years. And there was also, there, we were just a staff of four. But there was also a children's pastor. And he and his wife oversaw a whole like remodel of the children's ministry room, ministry wing. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. 
Well, the Saturday night before they were launching it on Sunday, we had a youth event. And it was like a youth event with parents and their younger siblings were going to come. So we were going to have the younger siblings with a babysitter in a different area. Well, we decided that we were going to have them in one of the rooms of the, nurse, the new nursery, the new kids ministry wing. Like now that I'm 42, that was a really dumb thing for us to do. But it made perfect sense um, when we were 28. So anyway, we decided that's what they were going to do. So we took them over there, opened up the new kids ministry, put the tables up there, put the pizza out, put a movie on. And then Kate went back and did our youth thing. I cleaned it up. I mean, it was spotless, guys. I really did. But somehow the children's pastor's wife found out we were in there. And she sent us a text message that night, giving us the what for. No, I don't think we responded. And the next morning, I walked in to drop my kids off in kids ministry. And I walked to the back. I could, you know, I walk in and she's not facing me. And she's talking to two other women and she's telling them what we did. And so I was like between before me and Joe. And I'm like, hey, Celeste. I don't want to say her name hey Jane are you talk? <laughs> are you are you talking about me and she turned around she's like Christina no I wasn't talking about you and I was like yes you were and she's like no I wasn't so anyway I signed my kids in and turned around I went and found the associate pastor's wife because I was gonna tattle and so her name was Beth I, I'll give you all her name I'll give you the other one too but this one doesn't matter I took her back to her room and I told her all about it I'm like crying you know, and she said, okay, Christina, she's like, she shouldn't have been talking about you, and, she, you know, she shouldn't have been more worried about her rooms than she was your event, and she said, but surely you can understand where she's coming from. Surely you understand that she was protective and wanted to be perfect, her room, and I was like, but I made it, she's like, shh, surely you understand, and surely you understand that she probably needed to vent a little bit, and then she said, because cause you're better than this. And I was, I was a little insulted, you know, like it seemed kind of critical of her to say that. Like she, I felt like she sided with the other, girl, the other lady, you know. And I went home after church and I was praying about it. And I recognized that that wasn't an insult. Her saying you're better than this was a compliment, right? She was recognizing like she was saying, Christina, you've got maturity here. You've got experience. You've got the love of Jesus. You're better than letting this silly thing make you so angry and so upset. And so that's what I feel like I want to say to us today in our marriages, whenever, you know, sometimes we feel like, you know, if murder is the best, you know, the better option that we'd be willing to, you know, at least imagine it for a little bit. Like, we're better than that, guys. We're better than that. And God's bigger than that. I mean, I felt like when we were singing, let the lion roar, like some things were breaking in me. And it felt good. Like sometimes brokenness can feel nasty and it can feel hard. But every affliction that comes your way, every time he brings conviction, it's for your good. Thanks for tuning in. If what you heard today was inspirational or transformative, tell us about it. We love your feedback. For more information on how you can get connected, check us out at firmfoundation.church.